together and, and question these things. I want people to think outside of themselves. You know, we if you look at Western philosophy, there's like virtue theory and all these philosophical theories that are about what's in, happening internally mm -hmm. and how the world views you from the inside. But in Native culture, we view ourselves as a part of the land and the animals around us. Mm -hmm. And we're not superior to one another. We're, we are existing with each other, and animals literally give us life. And so I ask people that they be more receptive to understanding other people's experience and other people outside of themselves and their own experience. Because it's really easy, especially in our society, it's instituted in our education, our politics, our when you get a job and you grow up, you have to make money for yourself, you have to make a living, and everything's materialistic, it's all about you, 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 you. Mm -hmm. But we really need to work as a community. We're not one individual. We are one community. And that's how people should think, especially in terms of art. I asked, is an artist's intention something to take into account in determining what cultural appropriation is or is not? Most non-Native people who are appropriating will say or claim they don't have any intentions to hurt anyone. But the, in that statement, there's ignorance that is harmful to Native people. And again, that replicates a whole history of taking and taking without permission and not acknowledging where the design or the imagery comes from, acknowledging those people the way they would like to be acknowledged. It's also not their story to tell. That's our story to tell about us. And again, it's if we were to look at legally how the Western society legal system, if there's any way that our legal system could protect indigenous art, it would be through it would it's our intellectual property, our designs, because we've been using them as clan crests, as our libraries, our documentation, all of our art is encoded with all of our information, you know. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors used this as our reading and writing and our tools of survival, our, our tools of identifying who someone is, who their family is, where they're from, and our relationship to that person. So they have these deeper meanings that go way back for time immemorial. And so just knowing that art and these designs literally have a spirit they're being on their own and when we create something we're putting that spirit into that piece it's representing who we are our connection to our ancestors and so when someone who doesn't have that connection or understanding takes that as their own it it certainly is disrespectful and even if they feel their intentions were good and not to do that they still are doing that to a certain degree. And so it's really important that we teach each other to be aware of that and teach one another, challenge each other to ask questions like, is it appropriation if I wear this? Is it appropriation if I draw this and sell it and make a living? That's the only way we're going to be able to coexist is by asking questions, challenging ourselves, um, being uncomfortable and asking those questions. It's not comfortable. It's also not comfortable for a Native artist to tell a non-Native artist, what you're doing actually hurts me. That is a very awkward thing to say to someone, but and some, most of the time, a lot of people won't speak up and say something because it's uncomfortable. But I, I challenge everyone to question themselves and to communicate with others. Yeah, because I know that not everyone has the intention of harming other people, but it's also, you have a responsibility to be informed and not be ignorant. In our day, we have the internet. There's so much information that's accessible. You can actually Google what is cultural appropriation 
is it appropriation if I wear a parka or a so one and sell it? Like, the internet is just too easy. There's really no excuse anymore to be ignorant. It's so hard to tell, to understand somebody's intention, right? Yeah. Particularly when they're kind of copying something, mm-hmm. you know. If they're copying something, what what's your intention? Like, I've been to different arts markets in Canada, and they have different kind of laws on as far as, like, who who's invited into Indigenous art markets. And, you know, the couple that I'd gone to, there was this artist who... She's an amazing beadwork or immaculate skills, beautiful beadwork, yet she's non-Indigenous and she's creating these works shoulder to shoulder with somebody in the next table next door who has less works than she does, yet they're making the same things. Mm -hmm. And then you look at her sort of display and it's, it's very, it's very Westernized and it's in its display and it looks kind of flashy and, you know, she knows how to market herself and... I asked her, I was like, well, are, are you indigenous? And, and she's like, no, I'm not. And I was like, oh, this looks like Gwich'in beadwork. And her response, you know, she, I could tell that this wasn't the first time she was asked this question, you know, and, and it bothered her that I was asking her that direct question. But at the same time, like, it's, it's important because she's representing a history and a context. All right, so she's creating a, she's creating a sewing bag. She's creating a, a Gwich'in sewing bag. You know, in my language, it's called the Hanatsesi. It's, it's the work bag. It's the work bag that you, you keep in your pack and you take with you everywhere because it's, it's basically your survival bag, right? Mm-hmm. And yet she's creating it without any sort of context to its history, you know, or any knowledge of, like, where that design came from or, yeah. or even any knowledge of how that design is shared amongst Indigenous peoples. It's shared amongst Native peoples all over the Arctic, from Canada to, you know, the southeast area. You know, it's like we all have a version of this design, and yet she's creating them, adopting this into her practice and profiting from it. I mean, that's a big part, is that she's profiting from it. To quote a guide created by the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Systemic imbalances of power are one reason why Indigenous peoples tend to have strong opinions about cultural appropriation due to the laws and policies that were imposed on them by non-Indigenous governments, they have had little say over their own affairs, including the practice and use of their own cultural heritage. It's hard to, like, individualize because you want to say, oh, well, this individual could have that many issues, those many reasons why. But you have to think about it on these larger contextual terms, these contextual terms of, of Indigenous people and the marketplace and white people in the marketplace, right? So it's like if you you have these global trends that show you that white people, you know, non-native people have an advantage, have an advantage of of the market, of knowing what to sell, of creating successful business models. You have indigenous people who who adhere to certain protocol in terms of creating and realities, realities of whether or not they live a subsistence lifestyle, whether or not they, they have a lower social economic status, whether or not they have different sort of traumatic experiences that they're as a community trying to heal from. So many more doors that they have to open to get into that same arena that this one non-native person is deciding to come in and instead of creating their own designs is just adopting an indigenous design and mass producing it. Ah. And it, it's really upsetting because her doing that, she also gave herself the option of deviating from designs and cross-designing things. Next to all of her beautiful beaded, immaculately beaded work were Inuit parkas. Inuit parkas that were kind of this sort of crossbreed between different Inuit designs and Athabascan parka designs. So it was something new, but she was she was deciding to adopt two different styles, mix them together, create something new and say, well, this is my thing. Two this is cultures. my thing now. Yeah. That wouldn't happen in indigenous markets. No. If somebody was to do that at AFN, there would be like a turf war. There would be an issue. <laughs> There'd be a problem because you can't do that because nobody is trying to take from each other. That I feel like that's the crux of a cultural appropriation is really trying to take and adopt something that isn't yours from somebody who has a, who has a different level of power than you do and profiting 
And when I say profiting, that could be in a monetary sense or it could be in a sort of professional career sense. You are elevating your status in some way off the backs of a history and culture and context that you didn't experience and you don't live within. That's just unjust and not right. It's upsetting because it happens so often. It's easy to take from people who are in a position of inequity when you have all the power. Both Crystal and Melissa agree that social media has had both positive and negative influences in relation to cultural appropriation. It's like you you have to continue to remind yourself that millennials are a bit different. And maybe it's a <clears throat> the social networking culture, you know, the idea that we're all connected kind of like in this way, like I can be connected to somebody in, you know, Milan who's doing the same kind of work and contact them in like an instant. We don't have a problem supporting people who are different than us, mm-hmm. you know, and it, I think it's just because it's it's this overexposure. We're exposed to it constantly. You know, we're exposed to different people, different cultures constantly yeah. as far as appropriation goes can make it easier to appropriate things It easier to draw from things, become inspired by things. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that it can be utilized social networking, our connection, our ability to access things. In, in a better way and in a way that we can support each other and in a way that we can question sort of these institutional roles, these corporations, these even individuals who are appropriating culture, who are questioning, you know, our very existence or the reason why we support someone different from us. I think it's interesting, like, thinking about that, you know, thinking about, like, what are, what are the positive roles of the millennial culture? And I think that's a real positive role is that we can support people who are different from us yeah. and we don't feel disempowered because of it. You know, with the Internet, it's, there's, it's an easy tool to access and to learn from. But it's also kind of a dangerous place because you look at people are kind of trolls online and will be brutally, you know, kind of violent with their words online. And so I think, though, it's really important that we make statements online and we share things and we inform each other. I spend a lot of time on Instagram going through and, and following other indigenous artists, commenting on them and sharing their work. That's another way, is sharing other indigenous artists and their names and their brand and their companies. So a lot of times when people really like Trickster Company, I'll say, have you also heard of Beyond Buckskin? Have you also seen Bobby Itza's leggings? Have you also seen Melissa Shaginoff's earrings? Like, depending on what product they're really into. Or sometimes my customer, I love this question when they ask, I love Trickster Company and your artwork. Are there any other artists that I should support that you think I should, that I would like? Um, That's a great question to ask. And that's also a great to share. I challenge everybody, Native and non-Native people, to ask those questions and to share names of other artists who are Native artists and to question themselves, when is this appropriate, when is it not, who should I ask? And I also challenge non-Native people to speak up when Native people are speaking up because we're each other's allies. Our art is this beautiful, beautiful thing. Form line design, cuspucks, uh, weaving, carving, it's all beautiful. And I feel that as a Native person, we certainly want to share the beauty of our art and everyone to feel connected with it. And we certainly can, but there's a healthy way of doing that. It's not going to be comfortable or easy for anyone on, for anyone. And that's a part of the challenge, but it has to be done. And a big part is asking people to ask questions, encouraging people. When I have people come into my shop, I know they, I could see in their face when they have burning questions and I welcome them. I welcome, I, I'm always welcoming people, whether I have an art market and I have a, a table with all of my art or they're coming into my shop or they're emailing me online about questions. I always welcome people in. Uh, everybody's welcome to come and support us. And I want people to feel comfortable and feel safe asking me questions. And I want them to feel confident in our product and who they're supporting and the reason. 
I want them to feel comfortable wearing my leggings that they wear. And so I encourage that people have any questions. I, I ask, do you have any questions? And it doesn't matter what the question is. 